On this week's exciting episode, Veronica Dale has plans for the lecherous Edgar Farrell, but he comes down with a little case of murder before she can put the blackmailing screws on him. What's a vixen to do? Make blackmail lemonade out of blackmail lemons and go for Farrell's partner. It's season one, episode nine of The Perry Mason Show, The Case of the Vagabond Vixen. <laughs> Welcome to the ninth episode of The Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. The goal is to do a pod for every episode of the television series and, if time permits, cover some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each week, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can rehash the ins and outs of the case. But first, to the Law Library! My dad pointed out the great improvisatory spat between Perry and Della in last week's The Case of the Crimson Kiss. Will you come on, or do you want to go back to the lobby and argue some more? You shouldn't have let a spade in the first place. You didn't have to raise the bid. You're just stupid. No setup needed! Della follows Perry's lead and engages in a make-believe tiff to throw Carver Clement's late-night guests off the trail. It's a great moment for two reasons. One, it gives us a sense of how in sync boss and employee are. Perry and Della snap in and out of character with a moment's notice. And number two, the scene also is hilarious because it hints at the romantic relationship that Perry and Della fans have always wanted, but have never seen completed. And it gives a reason why, perhaps, they don't opt for business plus pleasure. They're too good at having disagreements like this already. It would be a shame if they started having them for real. Now, to this week's episode. The Case of the Vagabond Vixen. We open on Peter Hansel, an oily type, and a young ingenue named Veronica Dale. They obviously have designs on some man, with Veronica's good looks and duplicitous hitchhiking as the bait. But what if he doesn't stop? I know that, Mouse. He'll stop. You won't be in the car 30 seconds before he'll start to get friendly. Sure enough, the wolf falls for the pretend lamb, and Edgar Farrell takes Veronica to his secluded house. Farrell is a motion picture producer who likes to come out to stay in this big studio house complete with his casting couch, drinks, and young girls with dreams of Hollywood stardom flickering in their eyes. I come out from time to time just to to relax. So, as you can see, I make it a point to have all the comforts of home. Like many a wolf before him, he gets got. Shots ring out, and Veronica, who has been shoved into a side room, runs from the house, chased by a torrent of Perry trumpets. At a gas station, she runs into a concerned stranger who's pretty shook himself, and she worms her way into his car for a ride. The next thing we know, Perry is driving to Fidelity Studios to meet our stranger, one John Addison, Pharrell's partner. Addison gives Mason a small assignment. Bail Veronica Dale out of jail. There's a girl in jail. I'd like you to get her out. What's she charged with? Vagrancy. I gave this young girl a ride last night. Later on, she was arrested. Why did she get in touch with you? I suppose I'm the only one she knew to call. She just got into town. 
Perry does the job and gives Veronica some cash after hearing her sob story about looking at the world through the reflection of a greasy spoon in Albuquerque. Where are you from, Veronica? Albuquerque. Why did you leave there? Well, you, you get sort of tired seeing the world from the back of a second-rate lunch counter. That, it seems, is that. But then the case gets all cockeyed. While Mason was away from the office, Della received money from a woman claiming she was Veronica's mother. Mysterious. Then, Mason hears that Addison has hired Veronica Dale only to get blackmailed by Peter Hansel, the oily gent from the show's opening scene. Edgar Farrell, meanwhile, is just out there rotting in the Hollywood mansion. Eventually, Addison gets around to discovering the body with Perry, but Perry quickly sees through the ruse and knows old Johnny Addison was at the house the night of the murder and that Hansel has some real blackmail evidence if he can put Addison's location together with what he knows about Veronica Dale. Perry, maintaining a safe, plausible deniability distance from the body, instructs Addison to stumble upon Pharrell's corpse with someone other than his lawyer. Well, I started to think about that blackmailer, Hansel, and how this girl can nail me to the cross, and I thought that would be better for me if I just stumbled on the body with someone like you. As your attorney, I wouldn't make a very good witness. He does just that with the help of his secretary, Myrtle Northrup. Good Lord. It's Mr. Farrell. I better call the police. Back at his office, Mason hands Hansel a check with Addison's trace signature on it and tells Paul Drake to let the banks know a forger is making the rounds. The next time we see Hansel, it's in police headquarters where Mason plays chicken with the blackmailing dirt digger. If Hansel can prove he didn't forge the check, then Mason knows he'll have to confess that Hansel was blackmailing Addison. I knew Addison had retained Addison you. was paying you off because you had something on him? So what? That comes under the heading of extortion. What? Establish your innocence in a possible forgery and you've laid yourself wide open to a charge of extortion. Treg enters to reveal that Pharrell was murdered and that Hansel could get immunity by offering testimony in the case. Now at the trial, evidence is mounting against Addison until, in a real detecting twofer... This might be just plain good news day for you. Not only do we locate Veronica Dale's mother, but maybe some evidence, too. What evidence? It seems the man I assigned to keep tabs on Veronica just happened to find himself in her room this morning after Berger had her check out. He also just happened to find that. Armed with salt of the earth, Mrs. Dale, and a little black book, Perry flusters Veronica on the stand and gets her to admit her blackmail chops and that she was at the house the night of the murder. Peter Hansel confesses to working with Veronica, but denies he was the one who sent out the fake Mrs. Dale. Perry gets some glad handing from Della and Paul, but he thinks the case is still hopeless without a clear alternative suspect. Don't you think you could have given Mr. Addison a little more encouragement? I will when it warrants it. Well, you completely ruined Berger's case. What's he got left? For one thing, the fact that the murder was committed with Addison's gun. But they haven't even found the gun. Well, they cross-matched the bullets. And then there's Addison's fight with Pharrell over control of the studio. And Addison was seen in the vicinity of the murder house the night Pharrell was killed. What's left is enough to send our client to the gas chamber. That's when he asks Myrtle Northrup to take him out to the murder scene again and discovers, who would have thunk it? Myrtle committed the crime. I... I didn't mean to kill him. Mr. Addison must be very proud to have a friend like you. But I did kill him. Mr. Addison had nothing to do with it. The Gardner novel was titled The Case of the Vagabond Virgin. Apparently you couldn't say the word virgin on 1950s television and thus the name change, with the irony that the new V word, substituted for the television episode, means the opposite of the novel's original word. Some major differences in the book. Number one, Addison is a department store magnate, not a Hollywood producer. Number two, Lorraine Farrell, Edgar's widow, loves Addison. At least this is according to Della. They never get together in the book. Number three, Myrtle Northrup never overtly appears in the book until she's being outed by Perry. And in the novel, she's Addison's HR guru rather than simply a secretary. 
Four, it's Perry who confronts the false Mrs. Dale and Della who solves the Addison Trace signature dilemma, which is interesting given the way Della's part plays out in the TV series. In the book, Perry is in a jam with the forged check until Della calls Addison and gets him to voluntarily call the bank and identify the Trace signature as his own. Perry is so effusive in his praise, it's worth quoting, You did perfect! Only you violated half a dozen sections of the penal code. Sad trombone. Wah, 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 wah. Five, Perry's interpretation of the case in the novel hinges on something that plays no part in the show, the ballistics report. The police think that the bullet that killed Pharrell came from outside the house. Perry shows that the bullet came from inside, and that helps reveal the real murderer. Now, let's get a little trivial, shall we? Each week in our trivia section, I'll give you three takeaways. Paul, a subject worth investigating more. Della, something about a particular character in the story. And Perry, something we learn about our main character. Our Paul this week has to do with the Los Angeles weather and this simple question, why are all the men wearing big overcoats? You've got Pharrell, Addison, and Perry for sure. Even the greasy Hansel gets in on the act when he visits Perry's office in a trench coat. What's up? Ardella this week is, you guessed it, Peter Hansel. You didn't study law in seminary school? Portrayed by actor James Anderson, probably best known for his role as Bob Ewell in To Kill a Mockingbird. Hey, Captain, uh... Somebody told me just now that uh, they thought that you believed Tom Robinson's story again, Iron. In the book, Hansel keeps calling Mason a wise guy as though Hansel were a second-rate hood from a film noir. But James Anderson plays Hansel as a veteran convict who thinks he's the veteran. He comes up with the plan for Veronica's shakedown game, gives Mason the dirt on Fidelity Studios, is privileged enough to earn immunity from the prosecution, and is generally just a really good villain, even though he doesn't actually commit the murder. So let's hear it for the man who demonstrates the Peter Principle. A convict tends to rise to the level of crime at which they are most incompetent. Our Perry this week draws attention to our intrepid hero's cool factor, daddy-o. We haven't hit peak beatnik Perry yet. We'll see that in season two when Lieutenant Trag scats at the end of an episode. But Perry knows his hip lingo, you dig? Why are you doing this? Your age, the reason would sound just a little square. Don't clam up, Perry, baby. You can admit the vagabond doll's a flake, you dig? Our theme for this week's episode is good intentions. Of course our vagabond vixen and her nefarious pal take people's desire to help a poor kid out and use it to blackmail them. They use people's own good intentions against them until they get to Pharrell. Pharrell is actually easy bait because they know he doesn't have good intentions. Then we have our murderer. Listen to what Myrtle Northrup says is the reason she killed Pharrell. I knew I'd never see my own name up in lights. And I was going to make sure that Mr. Edison would always be there. This seems noble enough, but I wonder how long it was going to take Myrtle to speak up. It's tough to justify a murder by claiming good intentions. Let's just say, though, Perry believes in Northrop enough to say, with a good lawyer, she could probably get off for the crime. You know, with a good attorney, she might get off with self-defense. <laughs> That's what I thought, too. Now it's time for a Perry proverb. <laughs> Perry actually leaves Paul with a joke in this episode, and it's life advice, all rolled up into one. Any other message for the gentlemen of the press? You might tell them if they're ever tempted to pick up a lady on the highway, don't. If she's no lady, it could be murder. What cracks me up about this particular advice is that given the world we've seen in Perry Mason and the pension his L.A. clients have for getting themselves into murder scrapes, Mason is basically saying never to pick up a hitchhiker. In fact, given the high rate of murder in this town, there are plenty of other things you shouldn't do. That would include having anything to do with someone from Hollywood, 
boyfriends who are poor boys who want to make good, having anything to do with land deals, or chemistry experiments involving ducks, or roommates who've dated your fiancé, or marriage in general. There's no end to the pit things that Perry could say end in murder. Before we go, let's head to the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this week's pod that you'd like to comment on? Something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Next time, we get a little lesson on when to bury a body, because in Perry's world, bodies tend to get up and walk out. It's the case of the runaway corpse. Until next time, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beat.